Welcome back. This is part three of my review of Shmuel Pollan's book, All In For God. We're rolling now because we're going to get into gravity. And from a geocentrist flat earther, you know that's going to go well. The most famous formula in science is E equals MC2. No, Shmuel. E equals M times C times 2 is not a famous formula. E equals MC squared is a famous formula. By the way, I had the same problem with you behind the scenes arguing with you in emails, where you mentioned E equals MC2, and I corrected you to point out that you should be squaring C, not multiplying by 2. And you asked me who the hell I think I am trying to change Albert's equation. It honestly seems like you don't understand the difference. Anyway, we'll talk about E equals MC squared later, because there's a whole chapter dedicated to it. That creation never stopped. It's being recreated at every moment by God anew, so it's new rules all the time. Fix the speed of light, and you've essentially locked God out of the picture. It implies God made a world, fixed it mathematically, and then abandoned it. And this is not good for children. Abandonment is never good for children. But as you said a while ago, you won't be using any arguments from faith or emotion. But see, this is the problem. Nothing in your book seems to come from honest interest in scientific accuracy, in accordance with reality. It appears to come solely from emotional investment, and you've defined all your opinions on science around that. You know, it's weird how many religious people out there manage to believe in math and the speed of light, and not to think they've been abandoned by their god. You might almost think these things have little to nothing to do with each other, unless you make them have something to do with each other. I mean, why would the speed of light in particular particular be some kind of indicator of God's presence or absence. Anyway, after having discussed the speed of light in the last video, we have a brief discussion here of the speed of gravity. Get this. According to Newton, the speed of gravity is instant. Whatever that means. I've never seen an apple fall to the ground instantaneously, but that's what he believed. Go figure. So, <laughs> You hear about gravity acting instantaneously. You wonder to yourself, what does that mean? And then, having no idea what that means, you declare that you know what it means. It means an apple hits the ground instantly after it falls. Why on earth would you not stop after saying whatever that means and then try to get that nailed down first, instead of just making something up and assuming that's what it means and going for it? I could understand maybe that kind of a mistake in like a casual webcam YouTube video. This is your book. What's wrong with you? According to Einstein's general relativity, gravity is the speed of light. Uh-oh, that's not a good move, Albert. Because as we've seen above, there is no such thing as the speed of light. Have we? I wasn't aware of that. Honestly, none of your arguments even seem to actually work towards that. Like hell, even if Rupert Sheldrake were right and the nature of reality underlying the speed of light was changing slightly over time, there would still be a speed of light, and it would be whatever that was. As he proposed, tracked over time by labs and updated like a stock ticker ever so often. And that would still be the speed of gravitational radiation. I've never seen an apple fall to the ground at the speed of light, either. Has he seen such a thing? I think not. What a mess. Do I... Do I need to explain the concept he's missing here? Oh, what the hell, I've come this far. They're not talking about the velocity of a falling object, Shmuel. Or the acceleration of one. It has nothing at all in any way to do with that. Have you ever, in your life, heard anyone say that a skydiver falls to Earth at the speed of light? Before you tell me yes, the answer is obviously no, whether you misunderstood Einstein or not. What they're talking about, obviously, is the speed at which gravity affects an object. Say the sun just instantly blinks out of existence tomorrow. How long would it take before that affects the path that the Earth travels? Well, about the same length of time that it would take for us to see the sun blink out. Eight minutes, thereabouts. So for eight minutes, the Earth would keep on following its orbit, and after that, it would start traveling in a straight line. Kind of like the rock in David's sling. He's swinging it over his head around in circles. Then he releases the sling, the rock goes in a straight line, and whacks Goliath in the face. I thought it'd be good to use an example you'll probably understand. Now, Newton didn't know this delay would occur, so if he'd been right, there would be no delay, and the Earth would stop orbiting instantly after the sun disappeared. That's the difference. Really, the fact that your understanding of the speed of gravity got silly results like apples falling at light speed or infinite speed probably should have made you question your understanding and prompted you to look up what was actually meant. 
But again, you're incomprehensibly lazy. And speaking of incomprehensible things... You can't ever quantify God. He is the creator. And this universe is his creation. And he created a universe that, like him, that is completely incomprehensible to the human mind. Oh sure, there is much we can understand about God's world. It's completely incomprehensible, but we can understand a lot of it. But it's completely incomprehensible, though. But we can understand a lot of it. But, uh, next chapter. Finally, the Big Bang Theory. Well, this one's easy. He's going to understand this one just fine. The Bible famously starts with in the beginning, and this Big Bang story starts with no beginning. What exactly was there before the start of the universe? Before the Big Bang? Wait, don't tell me. We're working on it. Well, you can stop working on it. Ugh, working on a question you don't know the answer to yet? What idiots! Gross! You should just know everything instantly. The speed of knowledge is instantaneous. Or at least light speed. Because there are only two possibilities. Something or nothing. Uh, that's already far more than two possibilities. Like, okay, if we can adequately define nothing, which has been a bit of a sticking point with us, but assuming we can, then nothing can be just one possibility. But something, that's literally infinite possibilities. Look, I'll show you. There's something over there! Now tell me what it is. Do you see the problem? There's only one of your two possibilities, something, but we still have an infinite range of things it could be. So you don't have two possibilities, you have infinite possibilities. But you know what, even if I were to take something or nothing before the Big Bang as the only two possibilities of what was before the Big Bang, that's still a false dichotomy with regard to the question, what preceded the Big Bang in reality? Because sure, you can say something was before the Big Bang, nothing was before the Big Bang. You can also say I'm talking about the Big Bang, which is the start of expansion, and time began with expansion, so the answer isn't something or nothing, because before makes no sense, the answer is error. Or there's no point, no boundary, before which time really starts, but there's still no before, because saying before the start of time is something like saying south of the South Pole. Yet another option might be an infinite big bounce big crunch cycle, which is out of fashion right now, but it's still an option. We're not talking about what's in evidence, we're talking about what's an option. And in that big bounce big crunch infinite loop, you might say there was something before the universe as we inhabit it in this case, except that what was before it was this universe. So yeah, I can come up with other ideas other than what you said. I have no choice but to reject your dichotomy. If you say something, then that's not the start of the universe. There was already something there. If you say nothing, then you've lost all credibility. You are essentially saying that nothing created something. Why would I say either? Why would I say anything at all with confidence? Why would anyone? You know, we're working on it isn't just a thing people say for fun, right? But if something somehow preceded the universe as we know it, that doesn't make that not the start of the universe. If the universe is not fundamental reality, if there's something more basic than that, fine. Then fundamental reality preceded the universe, and the universe started later. Your objection doesn't make any sense. Well, in math, anything multiplied by nothing always produces nothing. It never produces something. What prompted you to choose multiplication? What even is multiplication, anyway? Okay, too early for that joke, it'll make sense later. But anyway, what if, instead of multiplying zero by something, we did absolutely nothing to it? No operation at all. Zero equals minus 1,000 plus 1,000. There, from zero energy, we've got 1,000 negative energy and 1,000 positive energy. That's mathematically possible, is that what you wanted? In that case, the universe didn't have something or nothing before it was something. The universe is just nothing. You know, like you yourself claimed in two different videos. If you look into the parts that are supposedly something, you realize that it's nothing. You go deeper and deeper and you will always find nothing. So this universe is nothing, and yet something great comes out of it, which is all of history, the entire universe. It's all nothing. It came out of nothing and it remains nothing. There's another option for our growing pile. Now to be honest, I'm not a big fan, but some smart people are, and I'm open-minded. Here's more of you proposing that I should believe exactly this. Because the true nature of the universe is nothing. Not a string, not a wave, not a particle. Absolute nothingness. This is the first concept that you need to understand. The Buddhists were right here. The universe is nothing but empty space. The next concept you must understand is that nothing really isn't nothing. And by that I mean that nothing is infinite potential. Anything can happen in nothing. 
Okay, so if there was nothing before the universe, there was infinite potential. Anything could happen, such as this universe just popping into existence for no reason. There's nothing to be explained. No need for God. Cool. Thanks for wrecking a bunch of your own arguments for God. Too bad I already wasted all that time doing it for you. To be a scientist who believes in the Big Bang Theory, you must believe in creationism of some sort. You can't sit there and say you don't know yet. You do know. There is only one way to get from nothing to something, and that that's if there was a creator involved, be it man or alien or a force. You're using the word creator purposefully to imply intentional action by some willful being, which is the assumption you make and the one you desperately want me to make too, but I'm not going to play along. Pick a different word. But regardless, we're not arguing about men or aliens or forces. We're arguing very specifically about a god, an all-powerful thinking being that wanted to create the universe for some reason. That's the claim you're so desperate to defend, and that's the one I'm telling you I don't believe. If you want to tell me an alien created the universe, fine, do that instead. We'll have a different conversation. But you're not going to do that. That's not your claim. In this video, and really in any of my videos, I'm not disagreeing that there was something chronologically prior to the universe. I'm not agreeing with it either, it's just not the topic. It has no relevance. I don't care. We're not talking about some general something. We're talking about only one thing, and that's your thing. I'm talking to you, not some person who believes the universe was made by aliens and forces. I don't believe what you say. I'm not going to let you conflate your idea with a bunch of other ideas you don't hold to pretend that if I accept any of those or give credibility to any of those or, you know, think any of them are plausible, that I'm somehow closer to accepting yours. They're separate claims. They're going to be accepted or rejected separately. What would be more logical? That a packet of matter and energy existed forever and created the universe? Or a creator created the packet of energy and matter as well as the created universe? Well, since the former requires one less entity, and a whopper of an entity at that, Occam's razor would tentatively incline me to the former. Besides, this packet of matter and energy, as you call it, wouldn't have created the universe. It would have been the universe in an alternate state. There would have been nothing to create. Everything that is would already have been there. All it would have needed to do is change, similar to how we see it changing all the time right now. So yeah, since that one's so much simpler and so much more plausible and doesn't posit anything new that we don't already observe, that seems like a very clear winner in terms of Occam's razor. Why turn a small packet of matter and energy into God when God could be God. It's belabored. It's a round peg in a square hole. Why turn anything into God? You've already got your matter and energy. Nothing else is needed. Keep it simple, stupid, as they say. I see no reason at all to propose two entities one of which is wildly complex and never before observed and lacking any compelling evidence, when you could just propose one entity that already exists, namely the universe. Adding that second entity doesn't even help us understand anything better, it just raises a bunch more questions than it answers. There's no need to assume it, there's no explanatory value in doing it, so why? The Big Bang Theory, well held up for veneration, is anti-intellectual. What is the spiritual damage of this anti-scientific lie? The child will now grow up believing random unguided events have all the power. Not the great artist named God who drew these perfect circles we see in the sky and the endless galaxies upon galaxies of an infinite number of stars, all working together harmoniously. I think the child will be happier and sleep better knowing someone who has that kind of skill, artistry, majesty, and power is up there, running the universe, don't you? Won't somebody please think of the children? Shmuel, not to sound callous, but I don't care a single bit what you think would make children sleep better if it requires indoctrinating that child into a bullshit lie that's going to define that kid's entire life and make it turn out like you. No, uh-uh, not interested. You want to do that to your kids? Go right ahead. Besides which, you said your god did the holocaust because it was movie night, so I'm not exactly convinced by the stuff about kids being happier or sleeping better. Either way, it's not an argument for the truth of your position, and so it's not relevant. Isn't that better than nothing? If your true original father is an atheist's Big Bang, I just can't imagine we'd all sleep as well. Just the way everything came together, it could just as easily fall apart. God won't let that happen, but nothing would let that happen. Well, I don't believe the universe came from nothing, so oh well. But if I did, being a cowardly little baby isn't a reason to believe or disbelieve something. But, but if I don't have my daddy to protect me, something bad might happen. Okay, yeah, maybe. So?
I'll deal with that when and if it comes to that. Are you seriously this fearful and weak? But either way, you said your god does genocides because he's into scary movies and self-harm. I fail to see how an all-powerful being with these proclivities is meant to create a sense of any safety at all. In fact, it sounds like about the most serious existential threat imaginable. But hey, on to evolution now. We're surprisingly not going to spend much time on it. I take this from a large atheist website. They, believers in macroevolution, insist that both man and the apes came from a hypothetical ape-like ancestor, the evidence for which has not yet been discovered. I got a question for you, audience. Do any of you believe that came from an atheist website of any size? What kind of website do you think it really came from? Well, the answer is it came from the Institute for Creation Research, and Shmuel could not be a more transparent liar if he tried. And who knows, maybe he is trying. It'd be hard to be this dishonest without putting in a lot of effort. Anyway, he spent some time insisting that no transitional fossils have ever been found linking humans and apes, and I'm not even going to bother with that. What interests me more is his backup plan in case these fossils are found, which of course they have been many times. You have no proof that these bones were ever a living animal. I can claim they were always there, and you can't prove me wrong. Life is full of surprises, right? We're in the world of making up stories here, so why is yours any better than mine? Why is my story that a skeleton probably came from an animal better than your story that it didn't? Because it's an incredibly reasonable inference based on the observation that skeletons around our environment come from dead animals? You're welcome to assert otherwise, but it's a massive reach and clearly just an ideologically motivated excuse to ignore evidence, so I'm gonna just ignore you unless you provide some seriously compelling reasoning, which you haven't and you won't and you can't. You should try that same thing when a detective finds a corpse on your living room floor. Oh, no, uh, no, detective, that's not a dead person, that was never alive. I don't feel very intellectually troubled in siding with the detective in that case. Or in this one. By the way, I thought you said the reason the universe looks old is that it actually is old and God just fast-forwarded. Are you saying the fossils are exempt from this? Like this wasn't a product of God fast-forwarding the tape? He fast-forwarded the tape and then he planted fake evidence afterwards just for laughs? Or what? You could have at least tried to make your excuses internally consistent before you started selling a book full of them. But Shmuel then grants, just for the sake of argument, that the fossils were once alive. In that case, he says, in pure Hovind fashion, You don't know if it had any children at all, and you certainly don't know if its children eventually become the human race as we know it. How could you possibly get that kind of mileage out of one single fossil find? This question always betrays a total ignorance of the opponent's position. Nobody says that any particular fossil was apparent at all. Well, I mean, except that ichthyosaur fossilized giving birth, but other than those cases. This is an assumption that's simply not necessary. It's not relevant to the argument being made based on these fossils. The assertion is not, here's a fossil which is the direct ancestor of whatever extant species. It's, here's a fossil with clear anatomical similarities to species X and species Y, which is probably very like the ancestor of species Y, and shows that animals anatomically transitional between species X and species Y existed. It's a found link, if you will. Now, whether this species or this individual itself is a direct descendant of species X or a direct ancestor of species Y is so irrelevant. And I'm pretty sure the young Earth creationists who make arguments like this understand that perfectly well. I think they understand what's being said and work very, very hard to pretend otherwise just to waste time and avoid the implication that's staring them in the face. It's been said before that if you found a fossil of every single individual but one in the entire chain of human evolution, all the way up until, like, yesterday, the creationists would still insist that you have no evidence because that one missing individual is still a missing link. And I'm inclined to agree. In this particular case, I'm a few years past attributing to stupidity what's much better explained by dishonesty. Shmuel talks about abiogenesis and it's nothing special, but then his number one argument rears its tiny head again. Does this make sense to anyone? Mass and energy? Soup? And from there you eventually get to living, breathing, conscious humans? Let's ask a child. Does a child even swallow this theory? The answer is of course yes. 
A child will believe anything you say. A child will believe a fat man climbs down every chimney in the world in one night to deliver presents to the entire planet. They'll believe there's a fairy that collects baby teeth in exchange for coins. They'll believe a bunny hides corporate branded chocolate eggs around the house. They'll believe millions of people saw God at Mount Sinai. That doesn't make any of it true. It doesn't make it false either. It doesn't make it anything because kids are dumb is not an argument. You're trying to convince me that you're right by telling me the least rational, least knowledgeable, least experienced people with the least developed brains agree with you. People who can't read or write or multiply or divide, who have to be reminded not to put their hands on the stove or run into a busy street, who cause warnings to be put on plastic bags because a bunch of them suffocated themselves to death, who can't hold a conversation for more than five minutes without getting distracted and telling you about which stuffed animal they like better. These are the people you want me to think back you up. And you don't just say this sometimes, you say this stuff a lot. You might want to think about whether this is really the knockdown argument you think it is. Ask one, is your very first great 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 50 times great grandfather soup? Yes, I eat soup and food is parents. You told me that with the maggots. So, my ancestors are soups. A big bang, or a man named Adam and a woman named Eve. Gotta love that false dichotomy. Either your 50 times great grandfather was soup and a big bang, or it must be Adam and Eve. Multiple choice question, two answers, that's it. That's not exactly an exhaustive set of possibilities for what your 50 times great grandfather was, don't you think? But hey, it doesn't matter, right? It should do a great job tricking that poor little kid into saying what you want to hear. Especially if you say soup real dismissive-like and don't explain at all what you're talking about. I think a two-year-old can handle that multiple-choice question, but not the PhDs. They can't see how ridiculous they sound, not just to me, but even to a child. So about this 50 times great thing, what kind of time scales do you think people are talking about when they talk about evolution? You should be thinking in terms of billions of generations, not tens. And nobody's grand anything is soup or a big bang because grandfather implies it already being alive, and you're talking about stuff that precedes the chemistry of life. Or maybe is sort of the primordial pre-life chemistry. Don't be dumb. No wonder you have to look for validation from literal two-year-olds. You think just like one. What is the price for this deception? The child now subconsciously believes that their ancestors are ape-like. But Shmuel, kids only believe true and correct things based on perfect reasoning and evidence. So doesn't that make it true? The natural conclusion, then, is that ape-like behavior is a family tradition, not a good message to send. Oh yeah, that reminds me. That video where he told the story about the jerk-ass rabbi on the plane who told the atheists their kids were acting up because they come from apes? I think I missed the point, kinda. A couple people mentioned it. The point, apparently, is, well, basically this. If you teach your kids that humans are apes, supposedly that's an endorsement of ape-like behavior, but if you teach your kids humans come from God, that's an endorsement of God-like behavior. Now, I think that was the airplane rabbi's point, I agree. However, I don't think Shmuel understood it, because he told that story in the context of earlier people actually being more godlike because they lived closer to creation. He told that story in support of that position. So he told it in a confusing context that seemed to me to imply it had a point it probably didn't have, although I think it's a point Shmuel had. Anyway. Who you come from will affect how you view yourself, and that in turn will affect how you behave. And I don't want to live in a society where people act like apes. More appeal to consequences, more won't somebody please think of the children, more irrelevant garbage. But you already do live in a society where people act like apes, and I don't mean this is a new development. I mean every single human who ever lived, lived in a society where people act like apes. Because all human behavior is ape-like behavior because humans are apes. The realization that humans are apes isn't some invitation to pretend we're mentally equivalent to some common ancestor between us and chimpanzees. Being classified with apes implies nothing about how we should act. It certainly doesn't imply we should change how we act or pretend that we're not human. We already act how our species of ape acts. We always did. If I could choose, even if I wasn't religious, I would rather teach my children that they came from a man and a woman just like your mother and father. They did. And thousands more before that. Considering what you failed to understand up till now, and especially considering what you'll fail to understand going forward, I'm not surprised, or even disappointed really, that you failed to understand the basics of what you're arguing against. But it is annoying. 
but they were humans who were much greater than us. This way, they have a greater tradition to live up to. By contrast, if you choose for them an ancestor that's more animalistic and inanimate than them, they will have a animalistic and inanimate tradition to live up to. Oh no, they might develop that weird fetish where you pretend to be furniture. Actually, wait, animalistic and inanimate. Uh, furniture that throws poop. Okay, well, we're done with the run-of-the-mill, normal, anti-science and creationist stuff now. So now onto the really silly stuff. First up, heliocentricity versus geocentricity. Does the sun revolve around the earth, or does the earth revolve around the sun? Science has already admitted they have goofed about this once, so our guard should be up. Listen up, science! If Ptolemy didn't get it right in the second century using his bare eyes and a shrug, that means you done goofed. It's a fact that the scientific community once had a man arrested, who later died as a result, for disagreeing with them about this issue. That should tell you something about science and what lengths it is capable of going to silence the truth. Pretty sure he's talking about Galileo again there. Oddly, he no longer seems to think he was murdered. He's getting closer to right. Now again, obviously, a man being convicted of heresy by the Inquisition of the Catholic Church is so far from the scientific community having a man arrested that I can't imagine that Shmuel honestly believes this point makes any sense. But that's not the strangest part. The strangest part is that this is a chapter against heliocentrism, and here he's saying Galileo was arrested for speaking the truth in favor of heliocentrism. Does Shmuel think Galileo was arrested for being a geocentrist? Or what? If you happen to believe the Earth doesn't move today, you're in for a rough life. Prepare to be mocked and scorned by the scientifically inclined. They can be merciless when it comes to this, and I really don't know why that is. Well, that'd be because it's hilarious. Sorry, but if you don't want to be laughed at, stop being so funny. If you believe in Einstein's relativity, which they do, it's hypocritical to be dogmatic about which one is moving. According to this theory, one clearly cannot state definitively one way or the other. There's not really a need to bring relativity into it if your issue is just with which one we define as moving. Stated specifically, Specifically that way, it's pretty simple. Unless it's being simplified, the system is typically thought of as both bodies orbiting the system's barycenter, either fully inside the sun or so slightly outside the sun as to be negligible. So it's not that only the Earth moves or only the sun moves. Both move. Both orbit each other, or more precisely, the barycenter between them. But because that point is so close to the sun, due to the sun's gravitational dominance, it makes barely any useful sense to say the sun orbits the Earth as meaningfully as the Earth orbits the sun. That'd be the usual answer, and I suspect that's about as deep as you've thought into it, if that. But even so, I think the question can be thought of in a deeper way than that. I'm gonna make a guess that you're getting this idea either directly or indirectly from this Forbes article from Richard Muller, which is based on the ability to choose different coordinate systems. Now, I'm not confident in that guess, you gave me no real reason to think that. It's just a similar kind of idea that seems to have got some traction. Either way, it doesn't matter, I'm going with Muller so I have something more interesting to talk about. Now, he's making a kind of point where, at the most basic level, I don't think you need to drag relativity in. Except maybe to assert that the interpretation of reality itself should change relative to your choice of coordinate system. Which I think is the point, so I understand why relativity's in here, I just don't think we need it to start talking about this. Because you could always choose whatever coordinate system you wanted to, whether the universe was relativistic or not. Like, for example, I could choose a coordinate system for the Earth, where the poles are at some static point points on opposite sides of the equator, and the equator runs what we would think of as north-south, and that's entirely valid. It just doesn't seem to be useful for anything that we want a coordinate system for. But that doesn't make it inherently wrong, because a coordinate system is just a way to label stuff. It's not right or wrong as such. And likewise, it doesn't change anything that's not dictated by the coordinate system. For example, with my weird 90 degrees flipped latitude and longitude system, one side of the Earth is still lit by the sun at any given time, and after each day, which part of the Earth is lit by the sun is going to be the same again. And it's those kind of ideas that made North Pole mean anything important to us in the first place. So although my coordinate system is valid, it's not nearly as meaningful to us as our actual system of latitude and longitude. That system helps us explain things that we see. The other one doesn't. In fact, it makes things harder to explain. There's no reason to favor that. 
Now, likewise, I could choose a coordinate system that places the Sun motionless at the center of the solar system, with all the planets orbiting around it and rotating on their axes, or I could choose a coordinate system that places the Earth entirely motionless at the center, not even rotating, with the Sun and the other planets following incredibly weird paths around it. And just as validly and meaningfully, I could create a coordinate system centered on my cat, who is depicted as never moving from one spot and never rotating. And I could depict the entire universe revolving around him in truly bonkers trajectories. Or I could make everything revolve around some random speck of dust seven billion light years away. Or I could make our solar system, including everything on Earth, revolve around my motionless hat. By using this argument, I'm not sure if you realize the true banality of what you're really saying, which is just anything can be defined as the unmoving center of the universe of the solar system or whatever you want in some possible coordinate system. Yes, it's true, and it raises a few questions about how we interpret reality. It's just not especially novel or interesting. But when you extend that out to, and therefore they're all equally valid and just pick whichever one you want, it really doesn't make any difference, now you're going to run into some real problems, because some coordinate system will be a lot more useful, and I'm afraid a lot more representative of reality, than others. If you choose a geocentric coordinate system where the Earth is motionless and everything else in the solar system goes around it, space-time still severely bends around the Sun because of its enormous mass, way more so than the Earth. The Sun is by far the more massive object, and therefore by far the more gravitationally dominant object, and that has results in the real world such as it exerting way more of a tidal force on the Earth than the other way around. The Sun and the Earth, both being orbiting, are both accelerating, but a real-life non-accelerating observer, one who's just looking at the system from above, not engaging in any of that constant acceleration that is gravitational orbit, and therefore cares nothing about what coordinates you prefer, would still see the Earth following an elliptical path and would still see the Sun barely moving. The only way you could make that observer see the Earth as standing still is if that observer started accelerating with the Earth. You know, like you are. If you compare the system to the stars, the Sun still lacks and the Earth still has an annual motion relative to them. Now here's a good one from Matt Strassler, who I know nothing about. He's got a blog, that's all I know. But he had some good articles kicking around ideas about this, and some of his commenters had interesting ideas too, and so I found that stuff pretty helpful in thinking about this, gotta give credit. So there were a few points kicked around, but the final one Strassler makes, and the one that he really thinks blows Muller's argument in particular out of the water, is that if the Earth is interpreted as as going around the Sun, it satisfies Kepler's third law, which says the ratio of the distance to the orbital period of all the objects orbiting some primary object should be equal. Earth satisfies this just as well as every other planet in our solar system, and like all the satellites orbiting the Earth, or all the moons orbiting Jupiter, or take your pick. This would imply that the Earth is acting similarly to those other objects, and is one of those objects that's orbiting a primary object, in this case the Sun. But on the other hand, if you interpret the Sun as going around the Earth, it does not not satisfy this law. So if the Sun is really orbiting, the relationship between its orbital time and its distance is unlike any other body ever observed orbiting anything. It fails to act like an orbiting body is supposed to. And this is independent of the coordinate system you choose. Now, Shmuel, I guess you didn't specifically say that it's equally valid that the Sun orbits the Earth as the Earth orbits the Sun. That was Muller's claim, but if it wasn't yours, then in that case we're not talking about orbits at all, a lot of this was pointless, and your assertion really just goes back to the boring claim that it's equally valid from different perspectives to refer to one or the other as moving. Which, I know, that's what I said at the start. But you did start off the chapter saying the question here is whether the Sun revolves around the Earth, or the Earth revolves around the Sun. And so I think this argument does have some relevance. Anyway, the short version of all of that is putting the Sun at the center of the system enables a reasonable explanation for why objects in the solar system move the way they do, which is entirely lacking with a geocentric coordinate system, in which a bunch of different observed phenomena that are independent of the coordinate system go unexplained and appear random and nonsensical, which as we'll see very clearly in the chapter debunking the number pi, is likely to be in your opinion a feature, not a bug, in conflict with your insistence here that only one can be true, that the earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the earth, period. And then of course there are practical applications of the sun-centered coordinate system that speak to its closer approximation to reality off the page. It allows for coherent, predictable explanations for the motion of planets, it has real, practical utility in space missions, and of course the math makes way more sense, it's a far better theory, if the sun does not orbit the Earth or my cat. 
So, you know, do what you like. Go ahead, try to define the Earth or the Moon or your lunch as the center of the universe with your little drawings. But life's not a drawing. Coordinate systems may not be inherently privileged, but there are compelling reasons to refer to one or another as more accurate to reality. We are in a position to do some real science, finally. Science is observation. What's the most obvious observation one can make on this topic? All that stuff I said about us eventually learning what he really means by good science is finally going to pay off now. And you know what it's going to be. I don't think you need me or him to tell you, but we'll do it anyway. Because it's hilarious. Just go outside and observe. The first conclusion one would reach is that the sun is moving from one side of the sky to the other. While I am staying still, that is science. <sighs> Bare eyes and a shrug. If you want to do science, walk outside and glance around. But you better stop there! If you look any closer than that, or God forbid, reason about what you see, you're nuts! You probably just hate the Bible or something. <laughs> yeah, this is not the only time he's going to say this. He repeats this a lot. He's very dead set on this. But interestingly, Shmuel himself has already given us some good reasons to not operate this way in the pursuit of knowledge. For example, on page 131, during his summary of all his reasons to reject science, he describes science as a method that relies on human observation which is always imperfect and subject to misinterpretation. Which is of course a major reason why the rest of the scientific method is necessary, to counteract the effects of imperfect observation and interpretation. And Shmuel gives us an even better reason to reject his approach on page 123 where he tells us, One doesn't always see what he thinks he sees. A magician's show fools many. So observation, even with your own eyes from a short distance, is far from perfect. I could not not agree more. So why are you now insisting that the only valid form of observation is to superficially watch the magic show, refuse to wonder if how you saw it is really as it is, look no deeper, ask no further questions, engage in no further thought, exhibit no skepticism at all? You'd be the guy falling to your knees in rapture as those magicians perform their sticks into snakes act, and yet somehow you've convinced yourself you'd be the skeptic. If I sit by a lake, it doesn't appear to be moving at 1,000 miles per hour, it seems completely still. Yeah, so does the dust on your dashboard when you drive down the highway at 60 miles an hour. I don't hear you saying that means your car's standing still, although you better be careful making charitable assumptions at this point. If you spin a wet ball, the water flies off. That's not happening to my lake or my ocean, or me for that matter. Spin it at a rate of one rotation per day. Obviously joking, try four and a half RPM. Still obviously joking, you don't have anything comparable to Earth's gravity there. Ah, fuck it. I shouldn't even try to joke about stuff. Jokes go over these people's heads so bad. But you're right to wonder if the centrifugal force of the Earth's rotation has the effect of pulling things outward, and it does. That's why the Earth is not a perfect sphere. That's why it's very slightly flattened at the poles and wider at the equator. It's part of why at the equator, you weigh a fraction of a percent less than you do at the poles. The other reason being that because the Earth is wider at the equator, because of the centrifugal force, you're further from the center of gravity at the equator. All right, but if you believe in relativity, anything's the center of gravity. <laughs> Ugh. So just as expected, there is an effect, but for some reason, with no calculation, you've assumed it should be some enormous effect that makes gravity seem like nothing in comparison, and I'm not really sure why. Do you have any reason for this, or is it just silly to ask? Now let's say the Earth was moving and not the Sun, as the scientists say. Do an experiment to see if it's true. If the Earth rotates on its axis 360 degrees in one day... I have to admit I'm getting confused here. What are we even talking about? This chapter's on geocentrism, right? The idea that the Earth is at the center of the universe and everything revolves around it? Whether the Earth spins or not is irrelevant here. If you have a spherical rotating Earth at the center of the universe, you have a geocentric universe. It might not be Ptolemaically geocentric, but it's geocentric nonetheless. Less. I want arguments for why the entire universe revolves around the Earth. You're giving me flat Earth arguments in my geocentrism chapter. But the problem is your whole next chapter is about flat Earth. You'll have plenty of time. Why are you wasting your geocentrism chapter on it? Show me the Earth's at the center of the universe, damn it! <laughs> What should happen when you go into a plane for a 10-hour flight going west to east? If the plane is flying with the direction that Earth is going, it should take hours longer to get to your destination. See, you're using the same knife for the flat-earth mayo and the geocentric mustard. You're getting it all cross-contaminated. I want a refund. 
Anyway, I guess in your idea, also when you get up to use the bathroom on the plane, you should be slammed to the back of the plane and turned to mush, because, you know, that's how velocity works. Uh, so he goes on for a while about how this should definitely change your flight times by hours, depending on which direction you fly relative to the Earth's rotation. And then, shockingly, he actually tries to present an objection his opponents might raise, which is irrelevant nonsense, but hey, you know, at least he tried. He doesn't do that very often. I have heard responses from scientists saying that the atmosphere around the Earth is also rotating, so the plane is, so to speak, part of the rotation. So that's more about why there aren't, like, thousand-mile-an-hour winds blowing all the time everywhere because the Earth's rotating within some bizarre stationary atmosphere. Doesn't really have a lot to do with the plane. Take away the atmosphere altogether. Make it a space plane. Or a lunar lander. No, let's stick with a space plane. Take away the atmosphere and the machine still won't suddenly decelerate to a thousand miles an hour slower than the surface of the Earth as soon as its wheels leave the ground. You'd need some enormous force acting against it for that to happen. Like smacking into a very sturdy brick wall that's moving a thousand miles an hour against the rotation of the Earth. And I don't know if you've been in a plane, but that's usually not a thing. Now, people who make this kind of argument somehow don't seem to realize that what they're proposing is that the plane should be constantly shoved against the direction of the spin of the Earth at a force great enough to propel it instantly to a thousand miles an hour. This force should not have that effect when the plane's sitting on the ground. I guess friction's a little more awesome than we give it credit for. But as soon as those wheels come off the ground, even one millimeter, woof, gone. And the question is, what do you think does this? There's no reason in physics why this should ever happen. In fact, physics predicts it won't happen, can't happen. And there's no sign that it does happen, so physics is right. So why do you propose it as though it's a prediction of physics, and based on what, and what physical force exactly are you proposing will act on the plane to cause it? If you just say, oh, physics says this will happen, and you leave it at that, well, all I have to say is, no, it doesn't, you're wrong. Show me where it does. Any plane worth flying will pierce right through that atmosphere and indeed get a head start from the Earth revolving against it, or a slow start from the Earth revolving with it. Again, take away the atmosphere. That's just confusing the issue. You have a plane. The plane's on the ground because gravity. The plane's traveling the same velocity as the ground. Because, you know, the pilot landed the plane and then hit the brakes and the plane slowed down relative to the ground so that now it's going the same velocity the ground is going. And that's why you can see the plane calmly sitting there, not being tossed around and wrecked. It's the same reason you can safely get up and use the bathroom on your flight from New York to Israel, which you say here is a flight you've taken, which is incredible, considering apparently you thought the plane should just be instantly wrecked by some counter-spin force. If I thought that, I wouldn't get on the fucking plane. Then again, you know what, you probably just bring up a scenario where this would inevitably have to happen, but you don't understand your own scenario, and so you don't even realize what you've just said. That's more likely. Schmult, not only can you get up and use the bathroom at 500 miles an hour and feel entirely normal, but you also don't spend the entire flight feeling like you're getting slammed back into your seat. Because what you're thinking of is not velocity, you're thinking of acceleration. You feel that push into your seat when the plane takes off because it's accelerating a bunch. When it's flying at a constant speed, you don't have that. Now, in real life, let's say a plane takes off, it heads in the direction that the Earth spins, accelerating from its starting velocity of exactly the speed the Earth spins, to 500 miles an hour faster than that. Voila, now it's going 500 miles an hour faster than the Earth. It got a head start from the Earth's spin, of the speed of the Earth's spin. The plane didn't start at zero miles an hour relative to the Earth's thousand miles an hour. The head start it got was that it was already going a thousand miles an hour, just like everything else on the surface. And likewise, if the plane goes the other way, it starts at that thousand miles an hour and has to slow down relative to the Earth's spin to get where it's going. If it goes 500 miles an hour in either direction, the result is it's going 500 miles an hour relative to the original speed it was going. Of course, this is assuming you're flying exactly east-west. Maybe that'll confuse Shmuel. Who cares? You know, I avoid flat earth stuff a lot because I always feel like I'm wasting everyone's time even explaining this kind of thing. Because it seems so painfully obvious, especially to anyone who's been in an airplane, like Shmuel apparently has, who knows that if you stand up in the moving plane, you don't just get turned to goo against the back wall of the cabin. Since the plane moving relative to the Earth and you moving relative to the plane are the exact same principle, you'd think that traveling on a plane once would clear everything up instantly for you, but no. Apparently, it actually does need saying and repeating endlessly forever. For the first time in this discussion,
We can do real science, and the scientists won't accept it. They've found some very imaginative, once again, ways to argue otherwise. Arguing against the evidence that the sun is going around the Earth as we all can see. And again we see what master of the universe Shmuel Paulin permits to be real science. Glance around for a couple seconds like a dumb cow, make up whatever seems easiest to wrap your head around, the end. I guess those awful, awful scientists aren't supposed to notice things like that you can get up and use an airplane bathroom. That's not real science. No, you should only notice the very, very very, very, very few things Shmuel is clever enough to notice. Anything else is anti-science. The damage to society in dogmatically teaching heliocentricity is we are teaching the children that they are not on stable ground. The Bible says we are on stable ground. Joshua 10, 12 to 13. There goes your promise not to use Bible verses. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still upon Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged them themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar, which is the Torah? So the sun stood still in the midst of the heaven, and it did not hasten to go down exactly a whole day. How does that say we are on stable ground? I'm not seeing it at all. It's funny that Shmuel's main objection to heliocentrism and the round earth is that children don't get to believe they stand on stable ground. Because if I choose to take that figuratively and not just literally, his insistence that there's nothing constant or definite or comprehensible in the universe, that everything is shifting sand all the time, that the universe doesn't even have a constant existence from moment to moment, but it's being entirely recreated over and over and over with different rules every time, and in fact despite being created, it's also literally nothing? That doesn't strike me as him setting up very stable ground for the children at all. Please Shmuel, think of the children, repent! And I think whether you can prove it one way or the other, that's a better belief to have in your life than believing we could at any moment be ejected off a spinning ball. Don't worry Shmuel, gravity won't just turn off and send you flying off into space. But you know what? Nobody cares what you like better. It doesn't matter if you don't like the idea that anything bad might happen ever. What matters is what's real, not what I, and most certainly not what you, prefer. And I don't really get why you like your thing better anyway, though. Your god does genocides to entertain himself on a regular basis. You told me that in this book. Surely that's a lot more disturbing and worrying than the thought of gravity randomly ending for no reason? But it's certainly not worth arresting someone over. There it is again! Shmuel! Galileo was a heliocentrist. He believed both that the sun is at the center of the universe and that the earth rotates. That's why he was persecuted by theistic religion, because he observed more carefully than they liked. He was not arrested by scientists for espousing geocentrism. You really should have looked up Galileo before you wrote this book. Well, it's time to move on to Flat Earth now, except it seems to me we already did that a while ago. You got me craving some juicy geocentrism, and I feel ripped off. This may come has a big revelation to you, but you have probably never seen a real picture of the Earth from space. The only ones we have been given access to, NASA admits, are photoshopped fabrications. Google Richard Simmon NASA Photoshop Blue Marble. Alright, I'll Google it. Did you notice that when you say to Google stuff, I actually Google it? Because I'm not fucking lazy, Shmuel? So the guy you're talking about is named Robert Simmon, not Richard Simmon. You seem to have mixed him up with Richard Simmons, the sweatin' to the oldies guy. Fan of his videotapes, maybe? Robert Richard Simmons turns data into images. Now, these are interpretations. They're not photos. Nobody claims they're photos. This is a sort of scientific art that's used to turn complicated data and ideas into something that the average person can visually understand. And obviously, in no way are these the only images of Earth. You've confused the idea that something is done with the idea that only that something is done. It's kind of like saying that if people paint pictures of trees sometimes, then nobody ever takes photos of them. This is the reasoning of an idiot. There are lots of different photos of the Earth in natural color and everything. For example, you can get them multiple times a day from the EPIC instrument on the Discover satellite. Richard Robertsons is not making these images. He wouldn't have enough time in the day. 
It should be obvious that these images are not real because the countries are different sizes and colors every time they come out with a different picture. Why is picture in scare quotes? It's clearly a picture. You're arguing against it being a photograph, not a picture. I really like that the picture that's intended to show how the colors are different in each Earth photo is printed in black and white. Quality book. And he's acting like a typical flat earther, specifically in that he appears to have never held a camera or a globe. Which is odd because he films with a camera and he owns a globe. Hey Shmuel, you remember all that lip service you pay to observation? Well, presumably you keep that globe somewhere, like on a shelf. Do you ever actually look at it? Observe it, if you will? Like when you're moving closer to it or further away from it? Stick your nose right up against China. Most of Africa and Australia are not going to be visible. But now move across the room and look again. You'll be able to see them both. Whoa, the countries are changing size. Ah! Stop observing science, man, that's anti-science! Yeah, that's a clip from a video I made three years ago, and I'm not bothering to redo it for you. Anyway, after you observe this, you could try something a little trickier. Grab a camera and mess around with the settings. White balance, ISO, color settings, stuff like that and you'll probably see the colors changing significantly. And that's because it's a camera. And of course, lots of the colors on the Earth itself also change over time, but you didn't bother to observe any of that, because science, for you, must only involve the laziest, most superficial observation possible, and anything better is anti-science. Use your eyes. Science is observation, so observe. The very first observation man had is the same observation you have, that the Earth is flat. Glance around, shrug, make sure your brain's set to off, board your flight. You might also see very calm surface. If the ocean were on a curve, even a slight curve, it couldn't be calm. It would flow. Gravity would be constantly pulling it towards or away from the beach, flooding the nearby towns and indeed flooding the entire continent. I... You... I... But... But... I... It... The... You, gravity would? <laughs> Gravity, like the thing that pulls everything toward the center of the Earth. This is just like the plane. You're making a prediction contrary to physics. You're saying physics predicts it, and then you're saying physics is wrong because it doesn't get the prediction you made right. The phenomenon you insist has to happen as a result of gravity, that on a spherical Earth, gravity would make the water flow off the curve, presumably in some universally defined down direction, towards the South Pole, I guess, is actually a claim of an entirely new unobserved force working against gravity. Gravity pulls to the center of mass, so saying gravity would make the water flow down the curve against the direction towards the center of mass, like along the surface of the earth, and flood everything is nonsensical. So what you're saying should happen would have to be caused by something other than gravity, like some kind of water attracting magnet at the South Pole, I don't know. Something as yet unobserved that pulls all the oceans away from the direction of gravity towards the south. I'm treating this way too seriously, aren't I? I should probably just make fun of it and then call it a day. Haha, <laughs> you're stupid. Okay, I'm calling it a day. Thank you for watching. There will be more parts, and believe me, they will get worse. So come back for that, and if you would, before you go, please do give the video a like and click subscribe if you haven't. If you like the stuff I do on my channel, please give some thought to contributing with like a couple bucks a month on Patreon or wherever. It helps a huge amount, it keeps me going, and thank you enormously to everyone who's made that decision. If you want videos a little early, sign up to the email list at list.logic.com, and I'll see you next time.